Mark chapter 11 and uh, Mark chapter 11 verses, uh, let's read from verses 12, uh, actually from 11 to verses 20. Mark Kusuvartha Padukundava Adhyayamu Padukundava Matanunchi Ervai Varaku Ervai Yogati Varaku Man March March Shodakundam. Mark Kusuvartha Padukundava Adhyayam Padukundava Matanunchi Ervai Yogatava Matavaraku March March Shodakundam. Gospel according to Mark chapter 11 verses 11 to verse 21. Let us read responsively. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, it was already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. And on the, morning, and on the following day, when they came close to Bethany, he was hungry. And, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. Verse 15, And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers, and the seats of those who sold the pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away at its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you have cursed has withered. Let's bow our heads and invite the Lord's presence to minister to us through the word that is read for us. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you and your presence in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, as we come to your presence, Lord, to hear your word for the benefit of our soul, my Father, I ask you that you would Take these moments and sanctify these moments and speak to every one of us so that we, we may leave from this place having heard from you and the counsel of your word for our spiritual growth and nourishment. And thereby, Father, we be transformed into the likeness of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, as we continue our walk in faith in you, my Lord. To that end, I submit myself as I stand as your representative this morning, as a tool, as you're using me to deliver your word, Father. I submit myself into your hands. Be with me, guide me, and lead me, and speak to me and through me at this time. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Once again, Happy Mother's Day to all of us, uh, all of the moms here. And I'm uh, glad to celebrate this wonderful occasion with you all. And uh, there are moms to be. And uh, I can't just imagine next year they have the baby and uh, celebrate in a new way Mom's, mom's uh, Day. I hope they enjoy the rest of the day. And, and celebrate this wonderful day of God's goodness in their lives and on our lives as well. This <clears throat> is the first time we have to do this. We have to do this last week. 
whatever we have um, we have learned or we have seen, I just wanted to um, uh, summarize and then move on because the context of this passage is demanding us to understand where we are when we started reading from verses 11 onwards. And I entitled this, uh, this passage as uh, I'm, I was preparing as the two parables of judgment. Thirpunu suchinchu chunna rendu upamanamulu. Why I say this as a parable, you, we, will, we will slowly come into that understanding. But um, what is read before us in this hour is that there are two parables that we are seeing. The first one is the cursing of the fig tree. And the next one is the cleansing of the temple. And uh, we shall dwell in these as we move on um, to look into what God has for us this morning. Jesus purposefully declared himself as the Messiah to the nations as he brings the gospel to the people in and around the place that Jesus is in. And when he declares himself as Messiah, he first comes into Jerusalem and he declares himself that he is the, he is the king approaching or he is the king that is given to the redemption of the people of Israel and the nations. The goal of Jesus as he enters into Jerusalem is not only to declare himself as the Messiah, but it is also to provoke the people of Israel, especially the, the authorities of the temple, to provoke them so that they can crucify Jesus Christ on the day of the Passover. And that is the goal as we read these passages in the context of what Mark is specifying in these verses. Jesus is determined to declare himself as the Messiah. Jesus is determined to declare himself as the king that is, um, that is supposed to come and deliver the people, not from the political um, uh, pressure that Israel is in, but from the oppression of sin that they are all in. So as we looked into these passages, dear ones, we are now in the week, the last week of Jesus Christ. In within a week's time, he will be crucified and he will be put on the cross of Calvary and he will be dead in a week's time. And then after that, three days later, he would rise again. And these days, the church history recognizes these days as the Passion Week of the Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. The last week of Jesus Christ. So last week, we have seen that Jesus traveled into Jerusalem via Bethany and Bethphage and into the temple area. And as you read the verses number 11, after finishing all that he has done till verses 10, in verse 11, he enters into the temple by the evening time. And as the evening falls, and he enters into Jerusalem, and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, Jesus saw everything, inspected everything, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So here in this map, Jesus was traveling into Jerusalem, and verse, 11, verse number 11 says that he inspected the circum, uh, circumference of the temple, so to speak, or the area in and around the temple. And after he finished inspecting it, because it is evening and nothing could be done, he goes back to the city of Bethany, a mile's distance from the temple. And that is what we are seeing. And the, this week's, um, the week of, uh, the last week of Jesus Christ, 
we see that the events that are taking place and we have seen this last week and in the first day of the week which starts with Sunday Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on the back of a donkey and then we are seeing this is what is happening on Monday as he curses the fig tree this is Monday as he curses the fig tree the fig tree withers and then after cursing the fig tree according to Mark's gospel chapter 11 he goes into the temple and cleanses or clears the people who are doing business in the temple and then as he moves on after the cleansing of the temple we move on to Tuesday and on Tuesday the authorities of uh, authorities of the temple questions Jesus Christ and further going on the Jesus teaches uh, in the temple on Tuesday and Jesus was anointed uh, the, his feet was anointed on Tuesday and on Wednesday the plot against Jesus um, uh, was made and on Thursday is the last supper wherein he enjoys the last meal along with his disciples uh, in the upper room and on Thursday he comforts his uh, uh, disciples and after the comfort of the disciples and the uh, and the priestly prayer on Friday Jesus was arrested and he was uh, taken uh, for a trial for six trials and then after that on Friday Jesus was crucified and he was buried on Friday and we know what happened on Saturday and on Sunday Jesus rises again from the dead and this is the trial or this is the path of that passion week of Jesus Christ that we have seen last week and as we read the passage from verses 1 to 11 we have seen there is preparation going on in, in, in on the day as he approaches Jerusalem and we have seen that and the second thing is the false exaltation of the people they were shouting Hosanna save us and they were shouting praises as they were walking into Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of Passover it is a false coronation or it's a false exaltation of the true Savior and thirdly as we read in verse number 11 he, ex he examines the temple and because it is evening and there is not much, not, not much, nothing much that could be done during the time he returns back to Bethany and that's what we have seen and in this in this passage that we have read what what we are uh, looking at is a passage which contains at least two parables and in these two parables we see that it is a parable of judgment and uh, verses 12 to 14 and also from 20 to 21 it talks about the judgment that Jesus pronounced on the fig tree and it is alluding to something else that we're going to look at in this hour and secondly we are also going to see a second parable which is a preview of the judgment if the first parable is a parable of judgment the second parable is a preview to the judgment that is going to come upon Israel and thirdly we see a provoked response verses 21 and 22 uh, sorry verses uh, uh, 19 uh, 18 we see and the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him in fact the third thing that we are we are looking at the provoked response is what Jesus desired this is exactly the desire of Jesus Christ to provoke them so that they can take Jesus and and crucify him on the day of Passover and that is why all this while until chapter 11 he was hiding his identity as Messiah when he healed people he he often told them not to declare his deeds among the people and when he has been transfigured he told his disciples not to talk about the transformation or transfiguration to the people and so on until chapter 11 he was hiding his identity as Messiah because his time wasn't yet come and now as we read from verses chapter 11 onwards he reveals his identity as Messiah therefore provoking people to take action against him as it is required 
for, uh, for Jesus Christ to be crucified. Therefore, in the, the, the outline of the passage that is read for us, we see these three things. First, the parable of judgment. Second thing, the preview of judgment. The second parable, the preview of judgment. And finally, the third one is the provoked response of the people, the scribes and the chief priests and uh, what they actually did. That's how this passage is led for us. The first thing that we are seeing is the first parable of judgment. Matamadhika manu chustunam tirpo ne suchin chuchana twenty yoko upamanamu panindu vadhyam panindu padnalu vachinala manam chustunam dan tarvata irvai irvai okta vachinala koda manam chustunam. It is a parable because it is not a story but it is a parable in action. It is a parable that is acted and it is visible. Normally, this is the practice of the Old Testament prophets, how they execute uh, a parable to, to, to define a certain uh, a crucial aspect that they need to understand. If I verbally, if I speak something uh, as a story, it would always mean an earthly happening which has a spiritual meaning or a heavenly meaning and that's what a parable means oka upamanamu ee vidhanga cheppabadutundi ante bhuloka sambandhamaina atuvanti vaatlanu teeskoni paraloka sambandhamaina vaatini dani nunchi telapadave upamanamu aa vidhamga manam gamaninchinatlaithe ee old testament lo unnatuvanti ee yokka prophets the old testament prophets how did they actually conveyed a deeper meaning or a spiritual meaning or a heavenly meaning is sometimes they acted it out. They acted it out. Anaga, Vyavharapka Purukumga, Waka Upmamana ni Teleje say twenty, Waka Sandarbhani Manama Gamanistu Nam. For example, if you look into First Kings chapter eleven, verse twenty-nine, Madati Rajula Grandam, Padakunda Adhyaimu, Yeravai Tomadanunchi, Muppay Okatavarku, Manam Gamaninchin at Late, Akata Prophet as Ahiza Chasin at twenty, Waka Waka Karya Nigurinchi, Manamakar Sadukun. And it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that Prophet Ahija, the, the Shilonite, found him in the way and had clad himself with a new garment and they too were alone in the field and Ahijah caught the new garment uh, that was on him and rent it into 12 pieces after he rent it into 12 pieces verse 31 says and he said to Jeroboam take 10 these uh, take the 10 pieces for thus says the Lord the God of Israel behold I will rent the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give 10 tribes to thee Dear ones, as they wanted to show a heavenly meaning or as they wanted to show the spiritual meaning of a certain activity, they used to act it out. They used to act the parable out so that they can understand in a deeper sense what God is trying to convey to them. Second example is the example of Joshua. After Joshua led the children of Israel across the river Jordan, into the promised land, he then built a heap of 12 large stones. This was to serve as a visual reminder of the providence of God to the 12 tribes of Israel, how God has led them out of Egypt and how he has established them outside of the Egypt. When their children would ask, what are these 12 stones are about? Their fathers would convey them that these 12 stones represents God's providence and deliverance for the, all the tribes of, uh, of Israel. We see that in Joshua chapter 4, 4 verses 19 to 24. Another example as Isaiah was speaking out the heart of God, people of Israel became stubborn and gave no hearing to Isaiah. Then Isaiah starts to sing a song in chapter number 5 onwards. When they could not hear what God is trying to speak through the prophets, they would act it out so that they can grab the attention uh, uh, of the audience in a, in, a, in a different manner so that the message of the Lord is conveyed. He starts to sing a song and finally after, after singing the song, he would relate what it actually means, what God wants to speak to them. How about Jeremiah chapter, we see plenty of things in the book of Jeremiah, how Jeremiah acted out many, many things to convey one aspect of, uh, of the Lord God, what, they are, what he is trying to tell them. Uh, Jeremiah illustrated the hardness of the heart 
of Israel with the story of the potter and the clay in chapter number 19. And also in chapter number 50, he said that you are like sheep scattered when a lion is around. How about Hosea? In chapter 1 verse 3, Hosea was asked to take a prostitute as a wife so that the children of Israel would know, understand how it is the Lord feels as they betray their own God or the living God. So these kind of things are parables in action. And that is so prophetic and that is how the prophets of the Old Testament used to execute as uh, they brought the message the spiritual message from the heaven. How about Jeremiah 24? If you turn your Bibles to Jeremiah 24, there also we see a graphical representation of Israel. There are two baskets of figs. And in one basket there are all good figs. And in another basket there are all bad figs. And as Jeremiah was shown these two baskets, God says the good ones are the those people who are exiled and I'm going to restore them and I'm going to uh, give them life in full and all of that. We see that. So figuratively, these action parables speak about the real meaning of what God is trying to intend to speak to the children of Israel when they weren't able to understand verbally actions of these prophets would speak out the real meaning which is from heaven. So therefore, Jesus also, as you look into this passage, is also acting out the spiritual meaning of what God is trying to do to the children of Israel. Now, it is not the first time Jesus did this. He often did this and he often acted out his parables. For example, Mark chapter 9, uh, uh, for example, Mark chapter 9 we just finished this uh, verses, Mark chapter 9, verses 36 and 37. We see that he takes a child and he explains to them how they need to be transformed into somebody like a child so as to be great in the kingdom of God. This is acting out a parable. And also an example, for another example if I take, he takes, a, he takes a bowl of water and then he takes a towel and he starts to wash the feet of the disciples and he starts to clean them with the towel that is girded around the, uh, his waist, depicting how humble people are to be. This is parables in action. He showed it in action so that we would understand the deeper meaning of what God's heart is all about. And that is how, how about like when he took a cup and when he took the broken, uh, when he took the bread. As he was administering the new covenant, he took a bread and he took a cup. And as he was distributing that, he was saying this is the new covenant and that's a parable in action. Dear ones, that is how the Old Testament prophets used to um, convey a message which is which has deeper meaning as it is uh, so difficult to understand in the words of prophet they used to um, act it out so that people can understand dear ones in this way the Lord Jesus with that as a backdrop as Jesus was approaching he sees a fig tree and then the Bible the text says that when he sees the fig tree he was hungry and then as he was approaching the fig tree, he was desiring to see some kind of fruit on the fig tree. Now, Jesus just a moments before, he would knew which place had that donkey. He would knew who is going to ask a question. He would knew everything in advance. He is the creator. He is God. He knows everything. He is an omniscient God. Now people would ask, how come Jesus do not know that there is no fruit on the tree? It is not about Jesus do not know what is there in the tree or what is not there in the tree. But the text itself is talking about a parable that is acting out, which is showing us the, 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 the judgment of God that is falling upon Israel. Now as we read the text, 
on the following day when they came from bethany he was hungry probably he he woke up very early in the morning and as it was a custom for him he rose up early in the morning he spent enough amount of time in the presence of god in prayer every single day every early morning and therefore as he woke up so early probably he was hungry and seeing in a distance a fig tree in leaf he went to see if he could find anything on it when he came to it he found nothing but leaves now for it it was not the season for figs and he said to it may no one ever eat fruit from you again and his disciples heard it dear ones and his disciples heard it quite often figs or fig trees represent the land of israel or the people of israel are the fruit that they are supposedly uh, needs to be uh, brought to the presence of god for example as we have seen in jeremiah chapter 24 i'm going to read verses 1 5 and 8 for you and this is what the lord is speaking to the children of israel through the mouth of jeremiah the lord showed jeremiah and behold two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the lord there are two baskets and in one basket was five thus said the lord the god of israel like these good figs in one basket is full of good figs and the other basket is full of evil figs or bad figs and about the good figs jesus says verse number 5 thus says the lord the god of israel like these good figs so will i acknowledge them that are carried away captive of judah whom i have sent out of his place into the land and into um, a land of the chaldeans for their good now he's talking about the bad bad figs verses 8 onwards he talks about the bad figs and as the evil figs which cannot be eaten they are so evil surely thus say the lord so will i give zerachiah the king of judah and his princes and the residue of jerusalem that remain in the land and them that dwell in the land of egypt so the point i'm trying to drive here is fig trees and figs are always in the bible except for one time in the new testament where jesus saw uh, nicodemus sitting under under the fig tree every time fig tree is mentioned or figs are mentioned it talks about israel and the nature and the fruit of uh, that is uh, the spiritual fruit that should come out of uh, israel so jeremiah is talking about figs and figs are representative um, or symbolizing israel hosea chapter 9 verses 10 If you see Hosea chapter 9 verse 10 I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree first ripe in the fig tree at her first time but they went to Baal Poi uh, Peor and separated themselves into sh- into that shame and their abominations were according as they loved dear ones here also we see the representation of figs is Uh, or it is symbolizing the people of Israel therefore as we slowly unpack the meaning the heavenly meaning inside the activity or inside the action parable that we are seeing in verses 12 onwards is that we slowly will discover that Jesus is talking about a coming judgment in uh, to the people of Israel and as he approaches this tree it is not that he did not have knowledge about the tree do not have fruits but he wanted to execute an action about a spiritual meaning of what is going to happen to the people of israel therefore he took the opportunity of a fruitless condition of a fig tree full of leaves which also means if it is full of leaves it is also meaning that it must have a fruit that's the nature of a fig tree the nature I, i have a fig tree and i know that when it has leaves and every leaf uh, underneath every leaves is is a beautiful fig or it's at least budding a uh, budding at least if jesus would see a budding fig in it though it is not edible though it is not uh, eatable it would actually means that it has fruit on it but since it has no fruit on it it's a fruitless tree but it has leaves on it it's just a show off tree and then as it is sh- seen from a distance as though it is exactly like a fruitful tree jesus approaches it and uses that situation to speak a heavenly meaningful judgment that is coming upon the land of egypt uh, 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 upon the people of israel 
and as he approaches the fig tree and as he sees the fruitlessness of the fig tree Jesus pronounces a curse on the fig tree and as he curses this is what he says and he said to it may no one ever eat your fruit again fruitlessness is a symbol of depravity of any person or any 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 church or any congregation or any nation or any community so that is the condition as he sees this tree and as he demonstrates the parable the heavenly meaning gets descended into what he has done on the on 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 monday morning as he's going on, on his way to jerusalem so fig tree here represents the people of israel now that doesn't stop there the question the fruitlessness at one point jesus so desired and the desire of jesus christ is mentioned in hosea chapter 9 verse 10 hosea grandam 9th adhyayam 10th matalo the desire of how anybody wants to eat the first fruits of the season is mentioned in there in verses 9 uh, verses 10 uh, it says god so delighted that israel would bring out the fruit that it is supposed to bring the early fruit and mark says that it is not the season yet and then that puts us in a very difficult situation if it is not season yet why jesus is expecting a fruit in it but there is a, 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 a situation here wherein the tree is full of leaves and the characteristic of a fig tree is that if it has leaves it must have a fruit at least the first fruit of the season it has two seasons so according to uh, the the geological survey of that land fig trees have two seasons the first fruit and the later fruit and the first fruit is everyone's desire to eat of it because it's normally very very um uh, nourishable or it has a lot of strength um in it and that's the desire which we see in hosea chapter 9 verse 10 that he so desired to uh, see and enjoy that fruit um uh, of the fig tree but he had found none but leaves nothing but leaves are found on the tree which is only good for uh, destruction but then the question remains but then the question remains the text says that he cursed the tree and the tree withered and the disciples heard it and if jesus has cursed the tree and the tree is resembling the people of israel and then israel is under a big curse but that that is not what the text is um, is telling us the question remains who is this tree exactly representing and what is the curse actually speaking about and what is the future condition of this uh, the, the the set of people um, resemble uh, uh, portrayed by this tree in this parable so the question always rem- reminds us or the question always lingers us what does the tree represents in this context it is symbolizing israel for sure but not just the nation of but not the nation of israel but closely it may be related to the jewish leaders or the jerusalem temple leaders who are leading the people at that time when jesus was on the on this earth the understanding is more supportive because it is also pre uh, uh, it is also followed by how jesus cleansed the temple as we look into the rest of the passage 15 onwards he not only curses the tree but he proceeds into the temple and also works with the people in authority in the temple therefore the the understanding is the tree is not the nation of israel but the tree that god cursed that it would not bring any more fruit is the leadership of the jewish uh, temple and the practices just imagine when jesus curses for a lifetime it is it is it cannot be revoked or it cannot bear fruit again and that we see in verses 20 onwards as they passed by in the morning they saw the fig tree withered away from its roots to its roots therefore there is no life in it therefore as we read this passage and decipher it we can understand the jewish practices the jewish law the jewish rituals 
the Jewish things, whatever is happening, is unfruitful for the rest of the time of eternity. It's unfruitful for the rest of the time of eternity. The sacrifice that they offer, the rituals that they do, the law that they follow, so without heart, cannot bring any fruit for the glory of God. It is cursed. It is cursed. The clearing of the temple will tell you of the fact that Jesus is not happy with the authorities in and around the temple. If you can't believe me, you can also turn to chapter number 12, which starts with a parable. And it starts with a vineyard. Jesus speaking about the husbandmen of the vineyard. And the husbandmen of vineyard or the workers in the vineyard, they did not do a good job. They killed the prophets. They, 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 they misled all the people. And they ate the fruit that belongs to God. That belongs to its owner. And what, did, what does Jesus do? He pronounces a judgment on all the husbandmen. But the vineyard is safe. The vineyard is not cursed. But the husbandmen or the people who are taking care of the vineyard are cursed. Therefore, the curse that we are seeing on the fig tree is resembling a curse or symbolizing the curse on the leadership of the Jewish temple. The curse is, a, is on, the, on the rituals. The curse is on the sacrifices. They can never bring fruit to the Lord. So therefore, there are a few lessons, dear ones, that we need to learn from this fig tree cursing. Very few, but very powerful. It teaches us that each and every one of us into existence. God has given us an existence. We are expected to bear fruit individually. Vineyards do not bring fruit. Individual trees bring fruit. We may think the church will bring fruit. The church we cannot bring fruit. Individuals inside the church must bring their fruit. Organizations cannot bring fruit. Individuals do. So this is what the teaching, we are expected to bear fruit. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 verse 22 that we are expected to bring the fruit of holiness. The church is not holy unless every one of us is holy. It, we are expected to bring the fruit of righteousness. James chapter 3 verses 18 hammers this fact and we also know that we are all expected to bring the fruit of the spirit from Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 and Ephesians chapter 5 verses 9. Individual fruit dear ones, not collective fruit. You cannot dwell on my fruit and I cannot be happy with your fruit. You are supposed to bear your own fruit dear ones. Own fruit, dear ones. The second lesson we are, we, we are looking at is that appearances of goodness, good deeds, count for nothing but curse. I have been working on this fact, dear ones. That which is produced out of the flesh avails nothing. It will be burnt. It will be cursed. Good leaves cannot leave you any good. It will be good for curse. Appearances of goodness. He looked at the tree and it was so beautiful, full of leaves. But that doesn't stop our Savior from cursing. We might look good, dear ones. We might do a good prayer, dear ones. We might be good at understanding the scripture or speaking it out or memorizing it, dear ones. You may be good at coming to church and, and doing all the good things in and around your family. Everything might be good, but if you do not have fruit, 
in your life, dear ones, it is good for nothing. Good for nothing. It is like those basket of fig, which are evil fig, good for nothing. God says it will be good for trash. Good for trash. When once God curses, dear ones, there is no retarding of it. There is no retarding of it. There is no second chance after that. You are given only one chance for bearing fruit. Me included. Only one chance for bearing fruit. And that is the time that we are here on this earth. When Jesus comes to us and sees that we're all dressed up so beautiful and then we, we have everything pleasant to the eye. But if Jesus comes and sees there is no fruit in me, the fruit of holiness, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of the Spirit, if I'm not bearing it, Dear ones, I am good enough to be burned from my roots. Life will be taken out of me. And that is what the spiritual meaning of this parable, Jesus acting it out in a very graphic sense. Jesus is not angry because he is hungry. Jesus is not angry because of the tree doesn't have any fruit. Why would Jesus be angry on a on a tree which doesn't have a soul. It is not that Jesus wants to demonstrate his power on nature. Like he has demonstrated his power on the ocean. And he said, calm down the seas. But it is to demonstrate God's judgment upon a fruitless person in his vineyard. So therefore, these are the lessons, dear ones. And it also talks about, it is not the season for fruit, which talks about that you and I have to bear fruit in and out season. You cannot choose only Christmas time to bring out the fruit. Christmas is a great time to go and, and uh, preach the gospel. Outreach. Outreach is every single day. At our work, at our homes, at our neighborhood, in our church, outreach is every single day. You just cannot bear something during a season. You are supposed to bear in and out of season. Dear ones, we are running out of time. Let's quickly look into the second parable. The second parable of judgment. Tirpunu Gurchinatwanti Rindoko Upamanam Ganbarton Dikada. As they are approaching the temple, he goes inside the temple and they came to Jerusalem. And he had entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who brought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry through the temple. Anything through the temple. Here we are seeing a preview of God's judgment upon the leaders of Jerusalem temple. God's judgment. The second parable is working out. He has been in and out of the temple for many times. But this is the last time he's going to do what he's going to do. He's demonstrating something of a heavenly meaning. It is a preview of a judgment that is coming. This is just a picture of uh, the temple, how it looks like. How it used to look like. What you see in the center is the temple, the rest of the thing is the courtyard. And that courtyard is supposed to be for Gentiles to come and worship. 
Let me give you a small backdrop of how this is built. This is not the temple that Solomon built. Solomon built the first temple and that we see the account of his building in 1st Chronicles and also in 1st Kings. We will not go there. But it is quite a monumental effort in bringing and building the temple. He has spent a lot of money, a lot of labor and he has done a lot of work. And he has built exactly how the Holy Spirit has given instructions to his father David. Every corner, every inch of the temple was built exactly according to how the Holy Spirit has guided his father David. That's a monumental feat. But that temple was brought down. And we all know as we are reading all of these passages in Isaiah as we are doing this Bible study, we all know that it was sieged, it was destroyed, it was burned. But 70 years later, people who came back from captivity, they wanted their temple and they enabled Jerubbabel to build the temple and these verses are also mentioned in Ezra chapter 6 and verse 15 that's the second temple and it was finished sometime during the period of Ezra and what you're seeing is not the second temple as well but then the second temple was so small and modest but that temple was completely uh, desecrated or completely humiliated by a person called Antiochus. Antiochus, a pagan ruler, he offered all kind of blaspheme things inside the temple. He brought pigs into the temple and in the holiest of holies, he slaughtered them and, and completely humiliated the presence of God completely. Um, he, he desecrated it's called the abomination. That happened in the period of Antiochus. And Antiochus. But then the temple that you are seeing here is built by Herod. Herod the Great, he wanted to build this temple and he expanded the territory of the second temple. And then though the temple was a small place wherein there are chambers in it. He built a big courtyard so that there can be a lot of things happening inside the temple like the sacrifices. Now this is exactly the place where the money lenders, the, the, the changers and, and all the sellers of the pigeons and all the sacrificial animals are placed in and around this place. And this happened in 20 BC before Christ 20 and it was built all the way till AD 70 and it only lasted for six years. And in AD 70, this was completely burned according to the prophecy of Jesus Christ who said that not even one stone is going to be on the, on the other. So this is the temple. Now as he goes into this temple, in the courtyards, remember in verse number 11, he saw everything the previous day. And the next day he comes and he executes this action parable. And he comes and he does what he does. And what he is doing, he overturned the tables of the money changers and seats of those who sold pigeons. In fact, all of these people who are doing all this kind of business is very important to be done in the temple because there are millions of people flooding inside Jerusalem. And all these people are making sure the sacrifices are all without blemish. Because if two million people come into Jerusalem bringing their own sacrifices, there is a lot of time that is invested in, uh, in looking into the sacrifice for no blemish in it and then approving that for the slaughter and all of that takes a lot of time. So they have found out these methods and means of selling these sacrificial animals according to their needs. And these are all blemishless as they were sold inside the temple. And also many people from many different countries came into the land. So therefore there is a lot of currency coming into the temple. Therefore there is currency changes also in the temple. So all of these things are needed in the temple. But then Jesus comes 
and then uh, cleans them all and he says that these things are not supposed to be there and he overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons and he and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple now, now they have they have a route they have a road in fact it's like a shortcut when people come from the Mount of Olives, they can use this road through the temple to carry things. They have made the temple as a subway to travel between Mount Olives and Jerusalem. And Jesus would also stop that. Do not travel through the temple. Jesus stops all that. Dear ones, it is worthwhile to remember during the history of the Jerusalem church, only the kings restored the worship in the temple. And we see that across the scriptures, Joash, for example, in 2 Kings chapter 12, verses 12 to 17, he restored the temple worship. He cleaned the temple of all the idols and he restored temple worship. And how about Josiah, 2 Kings chapter 23, 1 to 37, also talks about cleaning of idols and restoring them. Only kings used to do this. What does that tell you? He's declaring himself as the king. When he, when he cursed the fig tree, he declared himself as a prophet. That's how prophets used to mention about the heavenly meanings. So he's a prophet, he's a king. There was a Jewish mind would know what Jesus is doing. It's only we who do not know because we do not know the entirety of what the Old Testament law is talking about. So it's worthwhile to know that it is only kings who restored the temple worship. So here is a king who is coming into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And he says, I am the king. I am the son of David. And because kings cleaned up the temple, I do the same to restore the true, authentic worship in the temple. Do you see the connection? And then... He goes on, for example, yeah, so Joash, for example, and jo jo Josiah, for example, and later not mentioned in the scriptures, but um, Judas Maccabeus, Jewish people celebrate this festival as Hanukkah, wherein he cleaned the temple and bought the menorah and, and uh, brought light into the temple. So Jesus declares himself as a king as he cleans this temple and restores true and authentic worship. He cleans the courtyard so that business is out of the temple, Gentiles flood inside the temple so that salvation is extended not just to the Jews but also to the Gentiles. To hammer this fact, he quotes Isaiah chapter 56. It is worthwhile to go to Isaiah chapter 56 at this time. Yashia Grandam, Yabayaro Adhyayanik Velite, Akadi Yesu Christu Prabhuvaru. Uh, so Jesus referred to that his house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples in verse 7. In 56 verse 7 he says, the, the Lord says, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the peoples, including the Gentiles from all the nations, KJV says. So therefore, he is cleaning up and he is quoting a verse saying that this is not supposed to be a business place but it is a supposed to be a place for the Gentiles. The courtyard is a place for Gentiles so that Gentiles can come and worship their living God. And chapter number 56, if you read it, it's going to give you the right picture of what God is trying to do over there. Verse number 1, thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness. For soon my salvation will come and my righteousness will be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds his fast, who keeps the Sabbath from not profaning. The first thing that he does is cleaning the temple for Sabbath from profanity and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Now verse number 3 says, Let not the foreigner, the Gentile, who is not a Jew, who has joined himself to the Lord, Say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Let not Gentile feel the separation. The Gentiles must feel their inclusion. That is what the scripture is alluding to, dear ones. 
the scripture that Jesus quotes in Mark chapter 11 as he cleans the temple and as he was teaching he said to me it is not written my house shall be called the house of prayer Isaiah 57 do you remember guys that Gentiles are supposed to be included Gentiles are not supposed to be muzzled or put on extra burden but must be included so that they can worship along with the Jews do you remember that and so on if you read Isaiah chapter 56 it's all talking about the restoration of the Gentiles now verses 9 onwards he talks about in verses in chapter 56 verses 9 onwards he talks about all you beasts of the field come to devour all you beasts in the field his watchmen are blind watch these words the, the text is talking about the Jewish leaders his watchmen are blind they are all without knowledge they are all silent dogs they cannot bark, dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. The dogs have a mighty appetite. They, have, they never have enough. But they are shepherds who have no understanding. You see what he is cleaning out? He cursed each and every one of them of their recklessness. So that they would never bring fruit. The Jewish rituals, the Jewish practices, the Jewish all the things that are happening in and around the temple are all cursed dear ones from its fruit hands of men can never bring fruit to God the Spirit of God can and he also quotes Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 11 he says you have made the house of God as a den of thieves he quotes Jeremiah chapter 7 verses 11 all through the scriptures, Jeremiah, Isaiah, he has them all in his mind. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 11 talks about it. Only to go on doing all these abominations has this house which is called by my name became a den of robbers. Dear ones, he was quoting Jeremiah. He was quoting Jeremiah. Therefore, just like Jeremiah acted out his parables, just like Isaiah acted out his parables, this is a parable Jesus is acting out a heavenly meaning. Having cursed Jerusalem leaders with barrenness, now he's clearing the temple to remove the trans traces of their activity, arresting true worship. All these business things that they're doing inside the church, dear ones, is arresting true worship. So he cleaned them all. He cleaned them all, dear ones. And by cleaning up the courts, he cleansed the place so that Gentiles can come and worship him. Gentiles can receive salvation. Gentiles can receive the presence of God. God is searching for true worshippers. And when he came in search of true worshippers, he found businessmen in the presence of God. He found people filled with the rituals and business mind arresting true worship to the Lord. He found them, so he cleared them all. He cleared all the traces of activities that pointed to sacrificial system because the true sacrifice is going to be offered in Christ Jesus, dear ones. So this, these are the lessons that we can learn from the second parable he cleared all false worshippers unnecessary people in the church who does business with God he cleared them all and their activities and by clearing up the the courtyards the Gentiles would come in and fill that place so that true worship is restored his act of clearing also symbolizes the fall of Jerusalem temple. That means God is going to destroy that which is built by hands and is going to restore it, that with a temple that is not built by hands. Mark chapter 14 verse 58 talks about this fact. He says that we heard him saying, destroy this temple that is made with hands and within three days, I will build another 
made without hands. So it is alluding to the destruction of the Jerusalem temple built by human hands and a temple that will be built without hands which is the Spirit of God dwelling in us and you and I are those temples. So it also talks about the end of a spiritual sacrificial system because Christ our Passover lamb is crucified the true sacrifice so that is the end of all the sacrifices that can be offered in a temple the end of sacrificial system so therefore dear ones as we conclude this Malachi chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 as we have remembered last last time dear ones behold I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple the Lord visits suddenly to this temple not this church this temple you and me are his temple know ye not that ye are the temple of the living God the Holy Spirit suddenly he will come into this temple and what he finds in this temple will dictate my eternal destiny he will visit you because you are his temple and what he finds in you will now dictate your destiny the destiny of the people of all the Jewish leaders are gone perish their fruit will never be considered for the glory of God dear ones who may abide the day of his coming who shall stand when he appeareth for he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness what about you and me? Are you a fruitful Christian? It's a question to me too. Am I a fruitful Christian? If I am, I am blessed. I am saved. If not, my roots will be withered and I will have no life in me. He who has the Son has eternal life. He who do not have the Son have not life. Are you a true worshipper? Otherwise Jesus is going to visit and cleanse every one of us if we are not true worshippers in the Lord. Because it is the two parables of judgment that we can see in this passage, dear ones. And as we approach this table, these are the two questions that I want you to ask yourself. I ask mine. 50% of application is my life. The other 50 is you. When God spoke these things to me, these two questions are me. Am I a true believer in Christ bearing fruit? No, standing here and speaking a message is not bearing fruit. Just because I'm an elder in this church is not bearing fruit. It doesn't make one. Just because I play keyboard and lead worship, it is not bearing fruit. God's not looking at it. God's looking inside of the temple. Not the outside. Am I a true worshipper? Is my worship crossing this roof? Shall we examine and partake in these elements?